messages on so, so there's quite a lot of stuff in there and uh, probably given that it's written in the title shouldn't forget that we've been working a lot with satellite technologies as well so, so uh, I'm going to show how these big physical infrastructures how the small smartphones how the software how the media how it knits all of these things together what, what I want to go through I'll just give a brief introduction that, that gives you a little bit more background on who we are uh, I'll then talk about some of the key components that, that are important to farming in developing countries, so the soil, pest and disease, uh, and then how some of these technologies link through light to, to, to how we can start giving information to farmers on what the risks are. I'm only going to touch very slightly on some of the models and AI, which stands for artificial intelligence, but that's some of the stuff that helps us not only know that our models are working, but helps us continuously improve them. And so you have to put a lot of checks and balances in with, with automated technologies. And so, so there's always a human component to check you're not going off track. The, the area that we think is probably the most important in all of this is the communication. And, and that will hopefully become a little bit clear when you see the complexity of some of the ideas we have to communicate and then realize that the audience we're dealing with, probably 70% of them have zero or very low literacy levels. To, to, to get started, what, what, why are we working in this? Well, obviously we have some social desires behind what we do, and we have a number of objectives that are to help a very, very large number of people. So there are 500 million smallholder farmers around the world, and the majority of those are in developing countries. Smallholder farming in developing countries is very, very different than here. Here, you might say 40, 60 acres, you call it small. You might even get into the, the low hundreds and still think it's a small farm. In a developing country, if you have five acres, that's medium. And yet the majority of the population of the world lives in these countries. The quickest ways to protect yourself against the elements is to diversify. The best way to diversify when you're in farming is to move from agriculture to adding some animal husbandry. It might be chickens, it might be a dairy animal, but it gives you a, a, an additional secure revenue to keep you alive. We have a strange name, it's Barefoot Lightning, and there is some story behind that. Uh, effectively, a barefoot scientist is somebody not who sits in a research area, but it's somebody who goes out and walks in a rice field with the farmers. You've got to take your shoes off to do that or your feet get wet. And, and so the lightning was just, okay, barefoot was a little bit boring by itself. You add lightning, it spices it up a bit, but lightning is a big, powerful, intense form of energy that causes a lot of change. So, so that's where our name comes from. We've worked in the high Himalayas in very tropical areas, in, in high humid, high rainfall areas. And we worked in Rajasthan, uh, where it's semi-arid and almost desert-like, across lots and lots of different crops. We've also worked with lots of different people across the, the supply chain. So we work with the individual farmers to understand their problems. But we've also worked with NGOs and groups of farmers to understand, okay, how do they come together and get some benefit from that? Uh, and that helps them understand, if you go somewhere where there aren't these groups that can help people, can you help them join together? We worked with large plantations, and the, the interesting thing there is the large plantations typically are buyers from smallholder farmers. The biggest way of impacting farmers is, is really through trade. 
if you can get a, a, a positive trade, obviously, but if you can get farmers to grow more, the only way to do that is to say that there is somebody there to buy it. I'm going to talk a bit about soil. This is very, very critical. So, so what we've got here is a lot of water. And the, the point here is that when you have rainfall, it doesn't just land and soak into the, the soil. It washes soil away. And, and there are some reasons for that. If you see what happens close up, when a drop hits the soil, there is a tremendous amount of force as it hits that ground. But you can do things about that. So, so if you look at the picture at the right, you see a nice clear drop of water because there is some vegetation cover. So, so the point is, if you start looking at that vegetation cover, it, it, it protects the soil. So when you pulverize, you create a powder. That powder, when it dries out, forms a, an impenetrable crust, stops more rain going in, causes more runoff, causes more erosion, more problem. So the more you can do to try and prevent issues in the soil, the better. And I think this just shows an example. If you see the bare soil, if you see soil now with some leaf litter, you see the different amount of wash through that you get. There's just a trickle of water in this case goes through, and you can obviously see it's a lot clearer. Uh, just wanted to really, really highlight that that soil, it's not mud, it's an ecosystem in itself. There are lots of different things. There are various worms, various nematodes, which are like mini worms, beetles that turn over the soil, you get ants, you, you get all sorts in there, including small bacteria, and all of those are important. This actually looks like a root system. It's not just a root system. This is something called mycorrhiza. And again, this is something that's very, very interesting. It's a fungus, all right? And what it does is it fuses and attaches to the roots of a plant. And so this is a biofertilizer that people use. You spread the spores of the fungus, and what, what it does, it extends the root network into areas the plant can't reach by itself. The plant feeds it a little bit with some sugars. In return, the mycorrhiza brings nutrient and water to the plant. If you plough the field, you chop all that up, so you lose your network. So there's a big move now towards something called zero till, which effectively is saying don't plough the field, leave the field as it is, and let those networks exist, let, let the previous crop decompose into the soil, you increase the organic matter, which increases also the water holding capacity, so it makes the soil more like a sponge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pest and disease, and, and this is going to be a relatively quick run through as well. That, that there are not many beneficial caterpillars out there, but there are a lot that like eating plants. Uh, some of them are quite benign, that they're not particularly damaging. Uh, it depends whether they get into a large scale infestation, and it depends whether they're carriers of disease as well. But what you can see again, it's eating the plant, so you know this is a vegetarian beetle. It is there are non-vegetarians as well out there. There are, there are meat eaters in the environment for us. And ladybirds are a very good example of that. A slightly scarier example is a parasitic wasp. It lays its eggs either inside or on top of the, the target pest. It will turn that pest into a zombie eventually as the, the, the larvae eat it from the inside out. It's a bit gruesome. But, uh, but, but it's actually a very nice or very good natural control mechanism. In fact, a lot of greenhouses now, especially in places like the Netherlands, are starting to release ladybirds into their greenhouse to do natural control. The big issue that happens in developing countries is I see an insect, I will spray. Okay. And, and there is an issue with that. Uh, because what happens in a, a nicely balanced agro-ecosystem is you've got your pests, you've got your beneficials, they're happily floating away in balance, in harmony. But if you come along now and you spray those, everything is going to die. And what happens when it dies, your pests, they migrate from wide areas, they can also build up a tolerance to pesticides. What can we do to try and manage that? So there are two ways. You can work with extension people, or you can work with farmers as well. And depending on the motivations of the farmers, you might be able to get them to start really looking in their field in a bit more detail. If we want to give advice based on any observations that they make, though, we have to be quite structured. Can you walk through the field in a certain pattern so that you cover quite a bit of the field? 
right? And, and that pattern is different depending on the crop, or that pattern even can be different depending on what you're looking for, what time of the season you are. So, so, so there's an element of knowledge that, that is about how am I going to evaluate what I'm looking at in the, of these pests. There's also a question of how do you count stem with a lot of aphids all over it. So that came as a group of aphids. You, you can't count each one individually. If you get the slightly bigger pests, you can count them individually, but how do you do it in a structured way? So you might have to look at two leaves at the top, which are nice, fresh, soft leaves that some insects prefer. You might look in the middle, where there's a bit more shade that some other insects prefer. Or you might look at the bottom with the decaying or dying leaves that, again, different insects might prefer. If you then want to look for counting ladybirds though, they eat a number of insects at a time. So you won't find by looking just under a couple of leaves. You have to look at the whole plant for a, for a predatory insect. So, so that's the way that you can start counting and having an idea of how, what, what is the balance in that ecosystem. And that lets us take data and start to give advice to farmers. What, one of the benefits of getting a farmer to do this is when you first see some insects, even if we don't do anything statistical, if he goes out and he counts them, and he comes back a day or two days later and he goes and counts, then, then what's going to happen is you start to take some of the immediate stress away. The left is uh, a very, very old device that, that was really almost handmade to do this data capture. We then shifted to PDAs in nice, secure boxes. Uh, the great news is we've all got smartphones now, so we can do a lot more with the information and the collection and also the sharing of knowledge. So if you start looking at disease, there are a number of different factors that make a plant prone to disease. So, so it has defences like we do, but it gets stressed and ill when the conditions are wrong for it. And part of what we need to do is understand what time of year, what conditions are there, so that we start to understand what disease might be, because you can't always tell just by looking. So some things that you might think are disease could easily be a nutrient deficiency. And that might manifest itself very differently on one of these narrow leaf plants or grasses versus a broad leaf plant. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now a little bit about light and space. I think We've probably all seen a prison from our younger days, and just, just a reminder that light is actually a number of different wavelengths, depending on how you want to look at it exactly. Our eyes can only detect three very, very broad bands. We, we see in red, green, and blue. We can't differentiate between these very narrow bands from, from our eyes. But there are detectors that can, which means instead of just looking at three colors, we might look at eight colors or we might look at 48 colours. Um, we, we've done some work actually with Manchester University, so those two things you see on the right hand side there are prototype devices we worked on to work slightly in reverse. We can use different coloured light to shine a very specific narrow band colour onto a leaf. Uh, and what happens is, if you see here, the, the green leaf on the right is what, what your eye would see. On the left is what you can see when you start doing a multispectral analysis. So, so these multispectral satellites do exist. What, one of the issues is they are very expensive to put satellites up. Uh, the, the good news for us is the European Space Agency put a lot of satellites up, and they're called Sentinel. These are groups of satellites that can do different things. So one of them is multispectral and it has eight different color bands. And you can see fields. This now is looking at some other technologies. So, so we have the satellite sensor and what that can do, we, it can give us a very broad idea what's going on around a large scale geography. What we have here are now the, the, the thing with the green thing sticking up is actually a ground radar. And they developed this radar to, to actually monitor the migration of insects by measuring their wing beats. The thing to the left of that, and I'll show some real images then, is a trap. That is an insect trap, so it has a big suction pump, very high energy, sucks a lot of air through, very high flow rate, and captures insects. Provided you get to that sort of height, you start to look at insects moving on the wind currents rather than insects just flying around in a field. So you start to get information about a much wider area and then combine it with the radar and what you see at the left then are some disease spore samples. So similarly they, they have a suction trap 
that pulls the spores in, and this automated one is using DNA to try and do analysis. Again, it's rough hamster technology. Uh, the low cost one just uses sticky tape, and then you have to take it away and do analysis in a lab and look at what you think you've got. There is a problem with this multispectral analysis, especially in the tropics, and that problem is cloud. If you look at the monsoon seasons, you can see here there is an awful lot of cloud cover. Usually when it rains, things grow. In order to deal with that, there is another technology called SAR, which is Synthetic Aperture Radar. This can see through cloud, and it can give you an idea of the height of the crop. It's quite a blunt instrument, but it's about the best thing that we can use in a lot of the tropics a lot of the time. So occasionally you get, just stepping back to where we do have multispectral images, on something called AFSIS, which is African Soil Information System. What that does is it's combining laboratory tests with spectral maps from the satellites. And what it's starting to do is give more detailed maps of the nutritional values of soils in different areas, which allows you to start getting close to saying, for this farm you need to do this, for this farm you need to do this. When we're talking about these traps and this trap network, the very interesting thing is the insects can travel about a thousand miles in a day. And so they can go the whole length of Vietnam in one day just by riding the current. So predicting pest outbreaks is actually quite difficult. You need to take a lot of different information and pull it together. This is now an example of what Rod Hampstead did with their radar in the UK. So, so they monitored the migration of insects, and we all knew that birds were flying around and doing stuff, but <laughs> we didn't probably realize is they're following the insects. It makes sense once you think about it. I talked about lots of data, and I'm going to give an example of how we use some of this data to start deconstructing nature. Uh, this is a nitrogen cycle. Again, some of you may have seen this in your school days or beyond. A relatively complex cycle, and it depends on one of those microbes I was talking about, bacteria in the men. You have nitrogen-fixing bacteria that pull the nitrogen out of the air and into the soil is the organic matter. So this is the leftover straw, it's the farmyard manure, it's decomposing plants, it's dead insects, it's things that are organic matter and they, they are the source of the nutrients into the soil. Of course if you want to work with farmers, and this is a conceptual model, if you want to work with those farmers and say okay how is your farm different than your neighbour's farm, you need to know some information from those farmers. You need to know about the farm resources. You need to know about the inputs they use now, and the inputs they've used historically. And by inputs, I mean the fertilizers. Okay. So what have they been doing to the soil that makes their farm different than somebody else's? And what have they been growing? Some things pull a lot of nutrients out of the soil. Some things don't pull much at all. But I mentioned right at the start that we have very low literacy levels with the farmers that we work with. So, so, so it's okay saying so we've got this model, but we have to understand how to get information from those farmers. Okay, so communication, this is the thing I said I was leading up to. This is the thing for us, getting that information from the farmer, passing information back to them. But, but we have a lot of challenges. It's not just a case of literacy, but numeracy. Quality information might not always come from an ivory tower. It could come from a little NGO shack that really knows what's going on with the soil. You find good knowledge everywhere and you have to understand what's appropriate. And if it's difficult for us, it's a heck of a lot more difficult for the farmers who, who we work with. There is another challenge, and that other challenge is saying not all crops are the same. And if you have a period of time where you're susceptible to a pest or need some nutrient, that means anything that has a longer or a shorter time duration when it's growing is going to need different advice as to what you do. But if you look at the majority of advice that goes out there right now, it says, okay, you're growing rice, you should do this. A very prescriptive, very much talking of people rather than, rather than actually engaging with them. Um, so, so what we do, we take that science base and we use multimedia as our way to communicate. Um, what does that media cover? Well, it's got to cover some of the main areas, so we've got to understand what are the practices, and I'll give you an example. So, so, so this is a push-pull system, and it's based around something called a stem borer. Stem borer, one of these nasty little insects, and it obviously, from the name, it bores into the stem of a plant. There is an insect research institute called ISIPI in Kenya, 
And then he did a bit of work with Roth Hampstead, uh, again, one of our main partners, and said, okay, what can we do to get insects not interested in these fields? We're, we're experts in insects, so let's see what we can do. And they came up with this system called push-pull, and I'll just um, I'll do this in a few steps. So I'll play first this stem borer. It's an interesting thing, the stem borer lands on your corn, and it lays its eggs, and now comes your little grub, and it burrows into the plant. So, so now I've got my plant, my stem borer in there, and it's going to, over time, won't necessarily completely kill the maize, but it's going to reduce its productivity. So what this push-pull system does, it says, okay, how about if in between the rows of the maize, I plant something called desmodium. Now, desmodium <laughs> smells horrible. When they arrive, though, they plant a border crop of something called napier grass, which, which actually these stem borers they quite like. So they fly over, lay their eggs there, and the great news is the little grubs, the little larvae, don't survive. So interestingly, when they did some more research, they discovered this thing called striger weed. And now striger weed is a thing called a parasitic weed. It digs its roots into the maize roots and it sucks the sap out of the maize plant and it kills the plant. There's no production at all. You get a field infested with maize and what they discovered was the push-pull fields didn't have this striger weed in them. And is this plant desmodium, as well as leaking nutrients into the soil because it's one of these legume crops, a bean crop that I was telling you about, it also leaks, leaks some other chemicals, some phytochemicals, but those chemicals the root exudates go into the soil, and what they do, they cause an early germination of the striger weed, a suicidal germination, because it germinates, and there's no plant for it to hook onto. Uh, and what's, what's very interesting is, this is not just a story about maize, it's a story about intercropping and border cropping. Uh, and, and the point, when you're showing this to a smallholder farmer, she can have the idea, you know what, what if I try this? And if you can get, see those ideas, that motivation, you can start doing research in the reverse way. You can start having farmer-led research from developing countries. So, so that's one of the real goals of what we're aiming to. You're dealing with multiple farmers sometimes. This is a group of farmers that came together for a meeting in, in that field to talk about what, what goes on. And, and the point there is you need to try and stimulate those groups. You need to understand how these groups work and try and fit in with them and add something that, that can help them move forward. This is some work we've been doing with um, Liverpool University now. And this is for a tool we call Paravet. So it's like a, a paramedic, but it's for vets. And again, there is a shortage of vets in developing countries. So we've been looking at, okay, how do we summarize a disease? How do we make it visual? How do we identify a disease? So, so we did a lot of work to categorize all the different types of symptoms you have. And we came up with a list of 78, which is an awful lot of symptoms. We then said, okay, how do we explain those? Again, using our animations. But, but those animations, again, there's a bit more humor in them and we're a little bit more competent on the animations, so they look a bit more professional as well. And what, what we've got there is a very nice way of showing animation and explaining a symptom so that anybody can understand. What, what, what do I have to tell you? I have to tell you about the symptoms so we can use the same animations, ideally with the same voiceover because we have to translate it for every new language. But, but so, so, so what we say, instead of describing a symptom of um, nasal discharge, a very nice one, we can say, okay, there are five symptoms. Nasal discharge is the first, uh, and we can describe that. Empowerment, engagement slide, and it's basically saying, we need to give people a helping hand, we need to help pull them up, but we need to then get them going their own way. So just like we give them some knowledge, they start giving back to us. And what we also want to do is say, how can we really, really get you interested in this? Well, well you know what? I'd love that I wasn't struggling all the time. So it's great that you tell me there's research, but do I trust you, do I not trust you? Might do it, I might not do it, but you know what? If you can give me some money, probably will do it. So, so we look a lot at how can we take information and put a value to that. Obvious question that crops up is yeah. if you're using these uh, 
apps mm. on smartphones and so forth yes. in developing countries. I'm, I know they're very, very prevalent in urbanised areas of developing countries, mm. but if you're in a field, yeah. what is the coverage like? The great news is we have thought about that, and so, so, so all of the content is preloaded. Right, so, so we don't do a stream, we have embedded animations, embedded voice. We're going to take data in, we're going to use this AI stuff to process it and figure out a better answer for next year. But for this year, we've got a mini model in the phone. And that mini model is built because I asked you some questions. Well, what crops did you grow through these? How much farmyard manure? I used this much. Okay, well, I think your farm has this much organic matter in the soil. Here are some simple equations that make the whole thing work. And in terms of initiatives with farmers in the Punjab or where yeah. it is, um, how have you linked up, if at all, with multinational food companies? I would say so some of it is about when you have those discussions as well. So, so for example, when we first knocked on Nestle's door, that tool that I showed you a little bit for chickens, which was a paravet tool, we were talking about doing that for cows and dairy. But that was eight years ago. And people hadn't quite got their head around what's an app, you know, especially in developing countries at that stage. There are some people who've been more successful than we have in linking with some of the big buying groups. We, we've been investing a lot in how do we communicate, how do we link, how do we get knowledge. Some other people have gone with, okay, here's my simple text form, let's get it out. So they've got links with big buying groups, and especially on the grain side, where you start to edge towards commodities. <laughs>